Hi and welcome back to the channel. Now I've got an absolute train wreck of a setup today because my wife's doing a fashion show, my wife and daughter. So I'm out of my normal space, my normal environment. So that's been taken over and uh, you know, rightly so too. And why am I clutching that? Um, that's for another video. Um, yeah, so today I wanted to share a story with you and this totally relates to this whole idea of enhanced experience of life, enhanced physicality, enhanced mental, emotional and spiritual um, experience of life. And I really want to encourage you to listen to the end of this because this is really what comes at the end of this is absolutely vital to the whole concept and hopefully um, I'm probably going to make a, a short story incredibly long but the idea is that I join up the dots so you understand what this is all about and why I'm sharing this. So here we go, got my notes here as usual. So this story unfolds in Central America a long time ago, way before my daughter was born and my wife and I were traveling. We've been traveling for some time. We, we were quite tired and we'd been going through lots of different experiences and we were on this pretty decrepit bus. I mean, the whole bus was just falling to bits, really. There's chickens on it and goodness knows what else, goats, um, people clambering around on the roof. And we were heading into this kind of it was kind of a border crossing, but it was in a very remote part. I'm not going to say the country, actually, because it's a beautiful country. I love the country and I don't want to say anything kind of against it. But we did have some full on experiences there. But anyway, we're heading towards this place. And as we come into where this this place is, uh, things are not looking good. I mean, basically, we, we see all these kind of army helicopters hovering above. And there's the, you know, just the army everywhere and people are, are not looking happy. The whole place is just a complete and utter, um, it, it'd been raining, torrential rain. The place was a mud pit. It was absolutely very run down, ramshackle. Everything looked like it was falling to bits and the bus station especially. So the, the first impression wasn't great. And we were kind of going through this place to get to somewhere else but we'd been on this bus for about 19 hours and I think our whole bodies were just completely shot we just needed to get off and have a rest but it wasn't the best place to get off and have a rest <laughs> as you will discover so anyway we we get out into this bus station and of course we're immediately hassled by people wanting to carry our bags and stuff like that we were the only sort of tourists that we could see anywhere so and you know that there, there was a lot of stuff going on just generally in that that region that we were on it, it wasn't a happy place let's put it that way so we get off and the first thing of course you know it, the inconvenience of life in all its glory I desperately needed to go to the toilet and it wasn't the kind of toilet that you could just nip behind a bush and go to so uh, after a lot of inquiries and searching and my terrible broken Spanish, um, I was pointed to this sort of shack at the end of this sort of overgrown jungle pathway. And I kind of make my way down to this shack. And I don't think anyone had ever been in there for years. But the stench coming out as I approached it was pretty overpowering. So anyway, I open the door and there's just masses of all these huge just like a web the whole thing was just like this huge web with with these incredible massive spiders everywhere I was like oh my goodness I don't think I can even set foot in there so so that that wasn't great so anyway finally I managed to to get that sorted and we stroll into this sort of I don't know whether you could call it a town even it was just uh, it looked like, and like I said, the with this sound, it was almost like something out of, um, you know, uh, the the program Mash, you know, <laughs> and these helicopters and you know, sort of uh, army people everywhere, and 
we had to go through this sort of um, barricade to get into the main uh, town. And of course, they, they wanted to see passports, documents, everything. So we're fumbling through everything to get our passports out, documents. And um, anyway, so we this took absolutely ages. I mean, everyone else just strolling through. And of course, we're the uh, we're the tourists there. So, you know, we had to adhere to these rules that they had. I'm not sure why. And it became obvious that the, the people that were looking at our passports and stuff uh, weren't that happy about let, letting us through. And the reason that obviously, you know, unfor unfortunately, the whole thing was, you know, about paying them some money to, to let us go forward. So I didn't really want to do that, but I think we were so tired and we just said, OK, all right, you know, how much? And we got that done and we, we're strolling into this town thinking that we're going to maybe find somewhere to just sit and have a coffee or something or a soda, what, whatever, you know, just relax for a little bit, put our, put our rucksacks down and, you know, just chill out. So we, we go to this little place, put our, put our stuff down. And then I suddenly thought, oh my goodness, I haven't got any money or hardly anything. <laughs> so this was the days, this shows like I'm, I'm a thousand years old. So this shows, this was a days, I don't know whether they even still have them anymore, but it, it, when you had traveler's checks, does anyone still remember traveler's checks? Now, these were the things like bits of paper that used to have, it looked like a check, like a checking book. You had to sign them and they were worth different denominations. So I thought, you know what, I'm just going to change up a hundred dollars. They must have somewhere to change the money. So hunting around and couldn't find it. Eventually, after again, a few, you know, false starts and very strange conversations leading me nowhere, I managed to find this place. And it looked like the sort of place that, I mean, you know, it, it, it didn't look great from the outside, but it kind of looked like it was doable, kind of presentable. And it was like one of those places where, you know, you can send money, you can post things, you can change, you know, you can change things up, you can change money, you can do sort of exchanges and different stuff in there. So, you know, it, it kind of almost looked sort of almost promising, but I don't know, not quite, almost. So, you know, Esther, my wife, said to me, you know, I, I think let's just check it out first. Let's just have a quick look first. You know, she's sensible in that way. And I was like, yeah, no, it's okay. Let, don't worry about that. Let's just get on and let's get on, get the money. Then we can have something to drink, something to eat, rest ourselves up and then get the next bus on, you know, whatever it was <laughs> on the way to where we wanted to go next. And, uh, you know, of course, not listening to the good advice. Uh, I get the travellers check out and, you know, you have to sign it. That was the whole thing. You had to sign it in front of the person that was changing. So I go in there again in my terrible Spanish, manage to say to the guy, I mean, just to kind of add to the mix here, um, I got in there and the guy behind the counter, he's got like, you know, the, the customary cigarette just hanging out the mouth and um, just totally not interested in me at all. I was the only person in there and didn't even look up, nothing. And uh, I get to the counter and like finally he looks up at me with the, with the cigarette going. And, you know, I get the travellers, I say, you know, we, we can do this. And he, he said, you know, he went, yeah, you know, kind of in enthusiastic, yes. <laughs> and um, so anyway, uh, I get the traveller's check. I go through the whole ritual. It's kind of like a whole ritualistic thing, isn't it? You get the traveller's check out and you get the passport and you get all these things and you put it down on the car and you have to sign the traveller's check and hand it over to him. And, um, you know, so far, so kind of so far, so good. So I thought, you know, let's just get this done and I'll get out there with my money, et cetera, et cetera. So anyway, I give him the traveller's check signed traveler's check because that's that's a check it's a good you can do you can go and exchange that for money so i i give him the traveler's check and then he counts out the hundred dollars to give to me and then he doesn't give me the hundred dollars so now he's got the traveler's checks or check 
and the hundred dollars. So I'm thinking, how do I how do I move forward with this? You know, without it looking kind of typical British. You know, how do I just do this in an incredibly polite way? So you know, we none of us feel bad about it, and it's all just kind of a mistake, and we all understand. You know, and so anyway, I, I said to him, you know, is it okay if I have the hundred dollars? And he just looks at me for a while. And then I'm standing there, he's standing there, uh, sitting there, he was sitting there actually, <laughs> I was standing. And um, and then I said to him, you know what, can I just have the hundred dollars? And he looked at me again, and then he sort of looked like he was getting something out of a drawer underneath the desk, because this was sort of one of these horrible sort of chipped and bashed up de desks with these sort of metal things, almost like, you know, grids going across it with a little gap for him so he looked like he was he was sort of getting rummaging under the desk to get something and I thought oh maybe he's just kind of you know going to get me maybe that's the wrong money I don't know I don't know what I thought I certainly didn't think what was coming so the next thing I know he's he's pointing like a a rusty horrible old like a, a shotgun, we used to say them in England, like ro robbers used to saw the ends off them. To, and uh, I, I don't know whether that was to make them more deadly or whether it was just so they could fit them into their jacket. But anyway, he had one of these, a shotgun, and he's pointing the shotgun to, at me. And uh, so, on, I mean, it just took, blew me away. I was like totally not prepared for this at all. And I'm thinking I'm in an official place, but I don't know. Now, all kinds of things are going through my head. And funnily enough, the thing that really went through my head, which was kind of unusual in a way, was that I got slightly transfixed on, on how rusty the, the trigger part of the, the, the gun was. And it was just going through my mind. I said, I wonder how much, you know, if that rust goes up into the inside of the gun and, the in the, and he's got a little bit of, how much pressure is it going to take for that? to go off because it's really it's a knackered gun and it doesn't look good and so it was almost like that took over and I didn't really show a lot of fear or, or anything so I'm still standing there as if I still want my hundred hundred dollars and so anyway he, he then gets up and comes round the side and I'm thinking oh maybe he's just gonna put it you know maybe this is just a kind of a mistake again typical British response to these things so giving him the benefit of the doubt so he then comes around with the gun and uh, literally points the gun puts it in at the side of my head and starts pushing me towards the door at this stage I'm thinking again uh, how rusty is that <laughs> how rusty is that trigger and and then it came to me, I, you know, I don't want to die thinking about how rusty that trigger is. So then I started to think about other things. So I started to think about things that I'd done as a child. And I started to think about people that I loved and all of these kind of things. And I just thought, yeah, I want those to be the, the last thing in my mind. But then the rusty thing kept coming into my mind. And then this terrible song from the 70s. 1970s kept coming into my mind you know which was um i think it was called brotherhood of man tie a yellow ribbon around the old oak i was like why would that i, th I always remember seeing the guy who was uh, trapped on a mountain oh, there was a whole story about it i can't remember what it's called now something like not the abyss it was called something something else but you know he he ended up with this i think it was boney m or someone <laughs> he couldn't get thought he was going to die and this song by Boney. Like, no i don't want to die talking about Boney M. But anyway, I, I didn't really want to die thinking about Yellow Ribbon and the Brotherhood of Man or whatever they were called. And But anyway, that's out. That's by the by. So by this stage, the kind of polite British side of me had evaporated. And I just thought, you know, I've got to get out of this place. And he was pretty clear that I was going out and I was not going to get anything off him at all. And in fact, uh, he wanted me to give him, he sort of indicated that, you know, 
he wanted me to pay him some more money or give him some other stuff. And I thought, you know what? Um, <laughs> what do you do in that situation? So I sort of started to head towards the door. And, you know, he continued to point this thing at my head and we're both sort of edging towards the door. So I then find myself, I open the door and he's still got, and so we go outside and he's still got the thing at my head and Esther's outside and Esther turns around and she didn't, it was like one of those things where the, the, the Native Americans didn't see the, the Spanish Armada when it turns up. It was so kind of not in our scope of things that she sort of first, she said, what, what, you, you okay, where's, where's the money? And I said, well, you know, kind of, and she went to him, what are you doing? Just, what are you doing? Give, give us the money, what are you doing? And I said, no, no, don't, don't worry about the money. It's okay, Look, we're, just, we're, just, we're just heading on our way. And S is fantastic. She's so she's so powerful and forthright and in her own feminine power. She just goes to the guy, oh, for goodness sake, you know, don't be so stupid. Give us the money. And I'm like, you know, don't worry about the money. It's OK. <laughs> so anyway, this situation continued and there's people around and no one's no one. Absolutely no one is paying any attention to it at all. So I, I couldn't figure out whether this was sort of a regular occurrence in this place. <laughs> Should anyone uh, something out of a spaghetti western should any sort of strangers turn up they, they get they get the the shotgun treatment it was probably i don't know maybe it could have even been made of plastic or something i don't know maybe it wasn't anything maybe it wasn't loaded i don't know but it certainly didn't look no it was, it was made of metal because it was rusty but it certainly didn't look good and i really thought to myself at one stage you know i just don't i just want to get away from this you know how am i going to get away from it and the situation, like as things happen in, in, in those kind of ways, time seems to stretch itself and, it, you know, become very, very different from normal time. And this seemed to go on for ages, almost in slow motion with him, with the gun and Esther and all of this stuff. And eventually I managed to take Esther, of course, you know, she understood <laughs> After, a, you know, it's probably it was probably only a few seconds, but it seemed like hours that this kind of whole situation suddenly really dawned on both of us. And we're like, you know, no one's coming to help. And, you know, this really doesn't look great. And so uh, I thought, well, how do I get how do we both get out of this? Because now now I was worried that, you know, maybe if he wiped me out, then he would wipe Esther out. And that would, you know. So where do we go from here? So anyway, like I said, short story, incredibly long. There was a lot of kind of weird exchanges and I don't remember all of them and trying to do this and he wanted something else from us and I couldn't figure out, I couldn't understand what he wanted. And the gun's still moving around by this stage is sort of like the gun's going here and every, I mean, I'm like, wow, where's it going? <laughs> and uh, in the end, I said, look, you know, Okay, okay. So I gave him, um, we, we, we didn't have anything, you know, I think it was only like $10 or something in, a, in my wallet. I gave him the $10 and, and uh, you know, the thing that was also going through my mind is, did I, did I pick up the part that I left the passports there and on the desk? Or, well, you know, I was like, God, you know, how am I going to get the passports? But fortunately, I, I had put the passports away before all this sort of unfolded as it did. And so anyway, we managed to back away and, and somehow we we mingled into to this these alleyways and we and, and we just got away and um, we, we took this incredible long tour all the way round everywhere, stomping through all this jungle and everything to get back to where we'd left our um, our bag in thinking. How did we mad we even leave our bags there? So, you know, the whole thing was just totally crazy. However, the point of me telling you this is not to point out necessarily how, how crazy the story was and all of that, which of course it was. It was what took place in the next couple of days after that that's really significant here. Because the thing that I noticed almost, I don't know, from the moment um, 
we got away and and I was really able to sort of just breathe and relax slightly, I started to notice that everything became very alive. Everything became crisp. Colours became incredibly vibrant. I could hear things so beautifully. It was like, it was almost like just being in the world without that situation around me, just being alive in the world was a benediction. It was like this, this gift. Every second seemed like a gift, a wonderful, beautiful gift. And it was like everything had become heightened and I could see life, but really, really see life, really experience life. The colours, the sounds, the words of people, even the words I didn't understand, just seemed so beautiful. The insects crawling under the table seemed so beautiful. The, the tiny specks of dust floating around seemed so beautiful, so enchanting, so utterly exquisite. And this carried on for a good couple of days. And it slowly, as we got back into the swing of things and moving and doing, moving through different landscapes, you know, this kind of the ordinariness of life seemed to, you know, steadily come back. What that really taught me, and I started to, this was a point where I really started to question the nature of our experience. And that exquisiteness, that triggered by the thought of, you know, maybe it was all just suddenly going to end. But then it dawned on me, and it's dawned on me many, many times since through different situations, that in, in many ways we're always at that point, and yet we never see it. We don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's coming next. We don't know even if our next breath is given for sure. And yet we go through life like we, we're going to be here forever, like, you know, we're, we're immortal and we're, you know, there's no, there's no sense of really, um, what's the word, drinking the elixir of our existence, tapping into the wonder of us actually being here in a visceral, having a visceral experience of, of being alive and this absolute wondrous communication and interconnectedness of everything and I'd like to propose that that is actually our normal state and this whole way of shutting that down it's like I was speaking in my last video the what's the what's of life this constant stream of what should I do you know or musts or have to's and shoulds constantly bombarding us it's almost like sort of cosmic radiation just constantly bombarding and we we put up these shields and these shields are not who we are we create these personalities these shells these personas to protect ourselves to keep ourselves from experiencing things on a really deep fully intimate vulnerable level and something else about that experience was that when I was in that the incredible vulnerability the sense that that at any second it could all just go and savoring any little vestige of life as it came through to see things clearly to actually wake up. And that's what fascinates me. That's what draws me into this discussion is the, the thing of waking up. And the more of us that we're all in that exquisite situation, it is already the case. It's already so. So this is what we're talking about here. This is why we're here. It's how do we open up to that? This is what this is about. How do we touch the wonder without having to have a gun pointed at our head? How do we tap into the exquisite nature of our life and live that? And 
really what I was talking about yesterday is, is when you have an absolutely compelling why and you understand that you're here for a reason, you're here for a purpose, then you start to get that sense that it's not urgency, it's, it's different from urgency. Uh, it's, an, it's, a, it's a relentless wish to engage deeper and deeper and deeper with life because you have something to do. It's important, it's significant, it's meaningful, it's powerful. And I've realised that this is power, it's love. It's power, it's love. This is the expression of it. And when we're operating in that mode, coming from that perspective, then the scintilla of life reveals itself. We see the colours, we hear the words, we feel the love as it emanates from things. Even things that we don't feel have any love in them seem to emanate love and are filled with love and are crackling with love and that beauty. And really what we're up to here is exposing that, helping other people to see that and experience it. This is what it's all about because when you are involved in life on that level, then the struggles and the challenges become opportunities. They become possibilities. And like I was saying yesterday in the last video, the truth is concealed within all of the stuff. But the truth is so wondrous that when we touch it, it fundamentally transforms us. And it allows us to evoke all kinds of different powers and, and different capacities and different capabilities. Things that we may have thought were just kind of fantasy before become reality. So I just wanted to share that with you and how important it is for us to wake up to our lives, wake up to the possibility of life and be present for that possibility. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and share the videos if you like them. And uh, yeah, I really look forward to seeing you in the next one. So blessings.